Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Bowhunting AZ podcast. Well, the draw for 2019 elk and antelope is over. I drew an archery bull tag during the rut and I can't wait to get out there and get after it. Today's episode is going to center around what to do now that you've drawn. But first, let's take a quick moment for those who make this show possible. Backwoods Grind. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a huge coffee nut. I like my coffee strong and a solid flavor to back it up. The guys over at Backwoods Grind have it going on. I get my coffee shipped every two weeks to me automatically, and you can choose whole bean or different variations of ground. You can opt for a one-time purchase, bi-weekly, or monthly basis. Backwoods Grind is a coffee that goes beyond the mug. From traditions to memories and long-lasting relationships, these are all built upon the passion brought to you by their blends, specifically roasted for hunters and outdoorsmen alike. Be sure to check out their three newly released blends, Camp House, Fireside, and Nightcap. Visit BackwoodsGrind.com and use code BAZ10 to get 10% off your order. I'd also like to thank Rax. Rax is hands down the coolest bow hangers on the market. Display your bow with pride in your house, your garage, or anywhere you'd like. They carry most major bow brands while also offering a custom service if you have an idea or logo of your own that you'd like to make into a bow hanger. Use them to display your traditional bow, compound bow, or crossbow. They also work great for hanging your hunting gear, bags, or hats. Not to mention, the designs look just plain awesome all by themselves. A Rax hanger makes for a great gift for that special hunter in your life. Go to RaxInc.com, that's R-A-X-X-I-N-C.com to see some of the available designs or contact Rax to discuss a custom hanger of your own. If you'd like to see how sick their custom hangers are, go check out my Instagram feed. For listeners of the Bohunny and AZ podcast, use the promo code PODCAST and get 15% off your order. Rax, show off your passion. All right. Welcome back, guys. So draw has come and gone. The Game and Fish portal is updated, and now we can begin to formulate a plan on how to attack our hunt preparation. So for this episode, I'm going to cover a myriad of topics. Having a game plan. I begin my planning by e-scouting. Randy Newberg has some phenomenal videos on this, but here's my personal method and the way that I approach it. If you're not familiar with the unit that you're hunting in, make sure you memorize those unit boundaries. It's always something good to know. After establishing the boundaries of your hunting unit, start by figuring out where you are most likely to access the unit with your vehicle, point of entry. Once that method of access is established, I'll start to waypoint a few good areas that look like open campsite options for me. I'll also set a few extra waypoints further into the unit so that I can have the option to move deeper in as I scout and eventually hunt. Now, this year's been an extremely wet year, so the game plan for me might change, but normally I immediately seek water when I go into a unit. I know that at some point, even on wet years, those elk have to drink or wallow eventually and will visit those watering holes. So not only is this a, a good thing, um, it can also help you see the rotating groups and help lay down their patterns. Once I've gathered a decent amount of footage off a watering hole, I begin to move my cameras towards the paths that they take leading into the watering hole. So pay attention to your camera placement and what, what direction those elk are appearing from as they enter the frame. Ask yourself, where does the animal, di animal diverge from before reaching that hole? 
If I move the camera off this watering hole, can I capture them grazing and establish their food source? Always try and establish those multiple facets on the animal that you're scouting. Food, water, bedding. Make those cameras do some of the footwork for you by placing them strategically and then adapt to it. Open Country Optics. Open Country Optics is your number one online source for optics and optics rentals. With quality Swarovski glass before your eyes, Open Country Optics brings the game closer. Rentals include a tripod, binos, and you can even add on a phone scope or foldable chair to glass from. All of the optics arrive in a durable Pelican case with insulated foam. You won't find any other company who provides you an all-inclusive package like Open Country Optics. Visit them today at opencountryoptics.com. Use promo code BHAZ and get 5% off rentals or $50 off any optics purchase. Open Country Optics, bring in the game closer. To find watering holes while e-scouting, I'll typically start by going into Google Maps, turn on that satellite view. From there, you can zoom into your general hunting area and start dropping waypoints on certain watering holes that stick out immediately to you. Now, just because there's water on Google Maps does not mean there's actually water there. Uh, side note, this year there probably is, but in years of drought, definitely be in doubt. Any watering source I find, I double check via Onyx, Flatline Maps, or whatever app you use. If there's water appearing across your applications and Google Maps, there's almost always been water there in my personal experience. If you find a good watering hole and you want to see the topography or the lay of the land around it, go use Google Earth and click that 3D button in the lower right hand corner. Uh, this will give you an idea of the overall topography via this like hovering aerial view. It's pretty darn cool. Once I've established a water uh, solid like solid watering source uh, that checks marks both Google Maps and my GPS application, I mark it with a waypoint that shows a water source icon of some sort, and then save that entire unit in multiple offline squares to my cell phone. Uh, the age-old debate, Onyx or topographical maps? Um, I've got both. So I use Onyx and Flatline unit-specific maps and Flatline's app. <laughs> uh, fl make sure to check out Flatline maps. They offer pretty much everything Onyx does, plus you get the added bonus of a unit-specific physical topographical map. Uh, their maps are waterproof and made of a solid, steady, Tear, sturdy tear proof material. Um, they really have a quality product and I have a couple of them myself. They're based right out of Prescott and so we got to support local. Scent Assassin. Scent Assassin, the new leader in scent elimination. Scent Assassin manufactures the latest technology in scent elimination spray, body wash, and laundry detergent. Forget the wind, hunt anywhere, anytime. Check out their full product line at sendassassin.com. Use promo code BOHUNTINGAZ for 20% off your order. Trail cams and what models I use. I'm currently using the Stealth Cam G42. I just checked on Amazon and they're currently $92.29. For the money, I think this is a great camera. Super clear quality. Uh, the 4K version might be nice, but it's just really not needed. 1080p does just fine for video, and the images are crystal clear. I like to set my camera on 8 burst photo and 15 second video clips. I chose the 8 burst photo simply because I noticed that a lot of times the does would come in first when a group would pass by, and the buck would follow shortly thereafter. I wanted to allow enough capture time for that buck to make his way up and into the frame while the camera was still shooting and I didn't miss the opportunity. Also, 8 shots or 15 to 30 seconds allows you enough time to capture the behaviors and see kind of what they're up to and how their personalities are during that time period. Now, trail cam boxes. If you're dropping cameras on public land, it's always a good idea to secure your camera via a trail cam lockbox. I'm currently using the cam lockbox security box. Uh, each box is specifically compatible with the make and model of your camera, so make sure you get that info correct when you're ordering one. Uh, mine's compatible with my Stealth Cam G42, and those are currently listed on Amazon for $28.77. 
This is a great solidly built steel box that houses your trail cam and really, really discourages anyone to mess with your camera. Also, if you're in bear country, this is another phenomenal thing to have. Um, of course, you have to have a lock to lock your lockbox. So I use the Master Lock Python cable. Uh, it's the camo version. They come in a two pack for $33.25 on Amazon. Uh, trail cam placement. Always place your cameras north to south. Just rule of thumb. Uh, reason being, when the sun rises or sets, you'll get a completely overexposed photo if it's facing east or west. Uh, especially, you know, when the camera gets triggered and you're just going to have this white blotch. <laughs> uh, keep an eye out for low-hanging branches, tall blades of grass, or any other object in front of the camera's view that may shift with the wind. I found this out the hard way when I did my first camera placement. All I saw was a lot of photos and videos of grass or branches swaying. Lesson learned. Uh, unique ideas for placement. I haven't done this yet. I've been seeing people place their cameras higher up on the trees, specifically pines, and angling them downward. This is to discourage theft, and also most people don't walk around looking up in the trees, up into the trees versus eye level. I'll be sure and post a photo to Instagram if I do this at any point this season. So be sure you're following me on Instagram as a lot of my feed there coincides with uh, these podcasts. You can follow me at bowhuntingaz. Camouflage your trail cams. I started doing this after seeing a series of camera thefts across Arizona. I'll typically take 5 to 10 minutes of cutting off small tiny branches just with my pocket knife and sticking them into different ported holes on my cam lockbox. Just make the camera look a little bit more like the tree trunk itself and or like a knot on the tree. And it seemingly works so well that I've even walked past my own camera a couple times. Uh, side note, also cover the master lock locking mechanism with foliage too. Hiding the lock itself is another great way to break up that pattern that may stick out to someone. Stealth Cam uh, unfortunately doesn't offer JPEG files, which is a little bit annoying. Uh, it doesn't work by just plugging your SD card into the camera. It has to be on a laptop or a card reader, uh, unfortunately. And their little card reader for the iPhone currently doesn't work either, which is kind of a bummer. So uh, I would avoid that and just keep that in mind. You'd have to have a laptop with you in your car or truck or something. Uh, what size cooler will I need? I use the Coleman Extreme Marine Pro. It's 100 quart. And I bought it at Cabela's. It cost me $109.99. And it holds ice for six days. And that's accurate. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll easily fit a full deer. I've done, that is also accurate. I've done it. Uh, there's also a 150 quart version available for $159.99. For elk, you'll need about three to four of these 100 quarts uh, coolers. Don't forget your ice. Uh, my Coleman, which I bought from my local Cabela's, held ice solidly for five to six days, no problem whatsoever. Plan ahead for meat processing. Don't get caught in the moment where you have meat sitting around and you can't decide what to do with it. Set money aside ahead of time or find a friend or family member who has all the available tools to do the processing yourself. Reciprocate with meat for anyone who lends a hand just as a courtesy. Uh, I also feed a large meal to everyone involved at the end of a long processing, processing day, and it's going to be a long day. Um, some of the items you might need, vacuum sealer, uh, if you choose to do that route. Me, I know it sounds silly, but I just like the look of butcher paper. I don't know why it has an old school feel to it, like an original feel. Uh, so, of course, butcher paper, if you decide to go that route. Um, also, uh, approach your local butcher or fry store ahead of time and ask them for beef suet. Uh, my local fries inform me they're fine with giving me some as they just toss it out, but they need to know ahead of time. Otherwise, it's put in like a nasty container that they didn't feel comfortable uh, retrieving it uh, from for me. So make sure to get ahead of the curve on that one and let them know that you're coming in for that. A uh, large folding table, uh, a lot of backwoods grind coffee, a solid music playlist, uh, and a minimum of an 8 to 10 hour day for processing. If you decide to just power through it, maybe two days if you're more leisurely. Also depends on how many people that you're going to have help you. 
Something else to think about is work arrangements. So I'm hunting September 13th to the 26th. Things I need to consider ahead of time are if I'm going to have enough PTO, what period of time I can afford uh, to take off, and if you're limited to time off, which part of the hunt do you want to be there for? These are all things to think about and plan ahead if you intend to hunt the full period or a specific amount of time during your hunt. Get it taken care of and planned out now so you're not scrambling last minute. Weather. I'd strongly suggest looking up the weather from the previous year or a couple years to see what you can expect. Plan accordingly and expect the worst kind of weather. This way you're not scrambling if a massive monsoon or something rolls through and just drenches everything. I found an awesome website called weatherspark.com and you can narrow down to the year, month, and day and see exactly what the temperature was, what type of weather was happening, cloud cover activity, snowfall if there was any, and what's what really is the exact time the sun rose and fell and when high noon hit. Uh, it's got wind speeds, wind directions even. All of this will be useful info to apply towards your hunt. I'll personally be printing out all the data for two for the two weeks that I'll be up there hunting. For me, it looks like it was a high of 77 on September 13th, 2018, and then a low of 39, just for example. Family time. I'm planning a possible trip with my wife beforehand to get some one-on-one -on -one time before my hunt. So contemplate a family camping trip, uh, maybe some time with your spouse or whatever, and maybe just take them to camp with you for the opening weekend and they can be a part of the whole experience is also a good idea. Calls. Which calls to take? Uh, don't forget a backup also. So I reached out via Instagram bef before recording to ask Steve Chappell what his thoughts were on the three to four essentials needed for elk calling. And he replied saying that, uh, I'd say first, a good open read call. Then, mouth reads for bugling and cow calls. Also, a grunt tube that creates back pressure for realistic sounds, especially chuckling. And most importantly, don't forget that wind checker. And my extra tidbit I'm throwing in is, remember backups. It never fails. Something happens to a crucial piece of equipment, and you'll need that extra read or cow call, wind checker, what have you. So don't forget to pack those few extra things. At least keep them at your campsite. You don't have to lug them all over the countryside, but at least have them at camp where they're accessible. Questions from Instagram. If you're not following me on Instagram, go and check me out at bowhuntingaz. Uh, the one that stuck out to me the most was, why didn't I get drawn? Again, I'm going to refer everyone to Randy Newberg's YouTube channel because he has a phenomenal video that explains the fine inner workings of the draw process. And I believe it was called uh, Applying for Elk in Arizona or something like that. It's pretty recent. So go watch that video and he breaks it down to the, like the nitty gritty details. But essentially it comes down to a bonus point system. If you're a first time applicant, Having zero bonus points is a very hard way to draw, although not impossible because it does happen. Um, some ways to get more bonus points is taking your hunter's ed class will give you one extra permanent bonus point per species. Also, if you apply for five consecutive years, you'll get a loyalty point. Uh, so keep putting in even if you're not hunting that species that year. And once you do decide to hunt it, you'll have the extra points available. Also, if you think there's a chance your wife or kids might ever hunt with you, start putting in for them now. This is something I'm going to start doing, and hopefully one day they'll be out there in the field with me sharing a great experience. Don't forget that this Tuesday, March 19th, at the Calvary Community Church off of I-17 is the annual Christian Hunters of America Turkey Hunting Seminar. Come get your calls tuned and hear calling champion David Barnhart, followed by an open Q&A session. Door is open at 6, seminar starts at 7. See you guys there. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Congratulations again to everyone who got drawn. Make sure to share the podcast with a friend. Don't forget to help me out. Smash those five stars and leave a review for me. God bless everyone. See you in the next episode.